Right, okay, so um, so a few words. Uh, so my projects, overall my projects really, I'm interested in sort of instabilities in the context of the sun. Uh, more particular sort of magnetic buoyancy instabilities inside of a region in the sun called the solar type of climb. Um, but today I'm going to talk about sort of a different problem, which is sort of motivated by the magnetic buoyancy problem in the solar type of climb, which just involves shear magnetic fields in the absence of gravity. So to give just some overall picture of the sun, um, at the base of the convection zone, we have the solar type of climb, which is a region of large velocity shear in both directions. Um, and so you get these strong toroidal magnetic fields, which are generated through the stretching of these weak colloidal fields. And so this is sort of one of the mechanisms for the solar dynamo, and it's known as the omega effect. And so this sort of shearing takes place in the presence of a stratified atmosphere. Um, but as mentioned, I'm going to talk about sort of a, a sub problem in which we have shear, um, shear layers and magnetic fields in the absence of gravity. And so even if buoyancy is not necessarily the driver, uh, this problem of uh, magnetic field in the presence of shear is uh, still related to uh, sort of astrophysical processes. So for parallel shear flows, for example, where uh, you've got sort of this flow in the x direction, which varies vertically. Uh, with Z, the stability of the viscous flows are governed by the Orr-Sommerfeld equation. And so there is a, an analogous sort of similar problem, which is less studied, where we consider a transverse magnetic field in the absence of a flow. And this problem can be unstable to uh, resistive instabilities. So we consider an MHD instability, the MHD instability in which UZ, UZ and BZ are linked sort of self-consistently. So you can see on this diagram, in particular, we consider the linear stability of an equilibrium, which arises from the shearing of a uh, uniform magnetic field uh, by a forced transverse target flow in Cartesian geometry. So you have this uniform magnetic field B0, and we apply transverse target flow. And then the resultant equilibrium is we have a, a magnetic field in the X direction, which varies with Z, our uniform field B0, and we have some flow, which may or may not be the target flow in the X direction. So we take the incompressible set of MHD equations, where you can see this is our horizontal forcing, our target flow U0, and we non-dimensionalize in terms of our target flow U0 and our vertical magnetic field B0. So you can see that we have these three non-dimensional parameters. We've got Q, which is the Chandrasekhar number, our Reynolds number, and our magnetic Reynolds number. So um, that is the system of equations. We've got our momentum equation, our induction equation, and our two, our incompressibility and our solenoid condition. So, so sort of to leading all, we've got our equilibrium. That's the solution. So we apply our target flow, as we've mentioned, it to the, the target flow, which is a field in the Z direction. And this, uh, sorry, a target flow, which forces a uniform field in the Z direction. And this leads to an equilibrium state, U and B, where there are the solutions to these two equations. Um, we consider U0, which is given by the uh, shear layer forcing, which is just a tanch lambda Z. Um, and order of magnitude calculations show that the basic state can be understood sort of in these three parameter regimes. So when Q is much greater than lambda squared, then U and B are given by those two. Um, and when Q is much less than lambda squared, then we expect the target profile, the flow to match the target flow, and B is given by the integral. And the last regime where Q is comparable to lambda squared. So the key point here really is whenever we change Q and RM, that's the basic state changes. And so it depends on Q and RM in ways that are sort of governed by these parameter regimes. So before we move on to the linear stability, so there's just a few comments to make which are important distinctions before we I sort of show some results. So in the absence of a magnetic field, Squire's theorem proves that the most unstable mode is 2D. So more precisely, if there's a 3D instability for a given Reynolds number, there's a 2D instability at a lower Reynolds number. But with both the flow and the field, however, Hunt argues that this isn't guaranteed um, 
so to be more precise, I guess we have two non-dimensional parameters now. We've got our Reynolds number and our magnetic Reynolds number, and so sort of the shape of the stability boundary is not well known. And so for this linear stability problem, we're not guaranteed sort of 2D mode, so we need to consider 3D modes. So we consider modes which are periodic in both X and Y, and which vary in Z. Um, and we just, okay, so we fix lambda to be 10, just moving on where, you know, the target profile is given by times lambda Z. And we consider the Reynolds number, uh, Reynolds number throughout now is going to be fixed at 35, which for the target flow is unstable. An important quantity is the ratio of the magnetic field energy over the ratio of the kinetic energy is given by Q times the magnetic Brandle number, which is RM over RE. So, uh, for a fixed lambda, there's a yeah, there's a three D parameter space to explore. We have our Reynolds number, our magnetic Reynolds number, and the Chandrasekhar number. And as I said, so for a fixed Q, uh, for a series of Q and RM, we optimize over both wave numbers K and L, and we take the mode of maximum growth rate. Oh, and so we end up with sort of this plot here. So what you can see is we can smoothly transition from hydro hydro unstable, which is the bottom left, to sort of magnetically unstable, which is the top right, while sort of impinging on an instability still. So, um, so the claim is, I guess, for small q, small rm, this regime is sort of governed by the Orsummerfeld equation, which I'll show. And then the top right is sort of purely sort of a magnetic system and the flow is sort of negligible there. And sort of moreover, there's you know, depending on sort of what path you take through this QRM space, there's a whole interest in array of things that can happen. For example, when the magnetic Reynolds number is less than one, if you increase Q, you sort of see this uh, stabilization effect. Um, and when Q is less than one with increasing RM, you also see a sort of similar stabilization effect. And so, you know, so depending, yeah, as mentioned, depending on what path you take through QRM space, there's a whole range of things that you can, that can happen there. And so to sort of attempt to explain what happens there, we sort of, we would consider a set of subproblems. So depending on the path we take through QRM space, different mechanisms are responsible for the stabilization. And to gain insight, we can study a variety of subproblems um, to the full problem. So we can study the awesome file equation where we lift. So we solve for the basic state and we take the flow and we put that into the awesome fault equation. Then we can solve this sort of stag static magnetic problem, which is where we take BZ by itself in the absence of a flow. And then we can study the static modified magnetic problem, which is where we have our BZ, but also our vertical uniform magnetic field. So in a sense, all of these problems, you know, they're artificial, but they're quite useful to help describe the dynamics in QRM space. And they can help us understand what these instabilities, you know, what the overall stabilization effect is due from, is caused by and sort of what is sort of the dominant effect which creates these instabilities. So to show that I'm going to fix, I'm going to, so Reynolds is still 35, it's still unstable in the target flow and I'm going to take two values of the magnetic Reynolds number and vary Q. So in the sort of large contour plus I showed two slides ago, I'm sort of taking a fixed RM and I'm going to move along that horizontally. So it's small magnetic Reynolds number you can see actually the, the full problem, which is given by the black dots, is actually, there's a strong correlation between sort of even at, you know, Q's order, order one. Around 10, there's still a strong correlation between the full problem and the awesome of our problem. So even though the flow results from sort of this dynamic process between the magnetic field and the flow, it's still, the stability is still quite well described by just the awesome of equation. And we can see sort of the magnetic problem and the modified magnetic problem is uh, stable. Um, whereas if we take a sort of larger magnetic Reynolds number, we see that the awesome fold and the full problem are quite different. So there's a greater influence of the flow on the flow, sorry, from the magnetic field. So we have that parameter, which was the ratio of magnetic energy to kinetic energy, which is given by QRM over RE. So I guess at best in this right hand plot, when Q is sort of 100th, that ratio of magnetic to kinetic energy is still only, is still a 10th. So you sort of expect there to be some influence of the magnetic field. And that's why we see this sort of stabilization effect. 
from the old summer felt to the full problem. And then sort of more interestingly, as we increase Q more, we see another type of instability emerge, which is purely described by the magnetic system. So at this point, so when Q is around uh, 200, you can see that the Orsomerfeld, the flow is stable here, and that's you know shown by the Orsomerfeld problem. Um, but there is an instability in the full problem, which is captured quite well by both the magnetic and the modified magnetic problem. And so at this in this regime, sort of the amplitude of the horizontal field is much greater than one, which is the size of the vertical field. And so I guess you expect it to be small influence. You expect small difference between the purple and dot and the blue cross because the influence of the vertical field is, well, it's small compared to the horizontal field. So you expect it to be small differences there. Um, right, okay. And then, so I guess there were some conclusions of future work. There was, so we've investigated the sort of self-consistent problem where I guess, so we could have picked U and B to be sort of arbitrary, right? So they could have been anything, but we, We've investigated a problem where both the flow and field are sort of self-consistent and they, you know, they're coupled and they interact to produce a range of instabilities which may have astrophysical relevance. We've shown that in certain parameter regimes we can isolate either purely hydrodynamic or sort of magnetic type instabilities. And within shear flows, there's two classes of flow. So we have sort of shear layers or jets. So therefore it would be it's of interest to consider, for example, something like the Bickley jet or we can you know, have another lambda there. And then on top of that problem, the, the shearing, ultimately the shearing of a uniform field is sort of in the context of the solar tachocline is inherently a time dependent process. And so therefore it's of interest to understand the linear stability of the time evolving state. And then further on top of that, I guess is to return back to the sort of the original enterprise, I guess, which was the magnetic buoyancy problem in which we generate a shear layer. Um, and current sheath in the presence of a stratified atmosphere through a similar process. Um, and so that's everything, I guess, if there was any questions, hopefully that wasn't too short. I've 